Thank you, Jane. Very good morning, everyone. Mm -hmm. A pleasure to be here at CCI, uh, taking part of this workshop with you today. This first presentation will talk a little bit about uh, risk-based decision-making and its application in the heritage sector. So I'm trying to make a case here, right? So why risk-based decision-making? So um, in our lives, we make decisions every day. Also, as heritage managers and caretakers, we have to make decisions on a daily basis, right? Simplest case is when there are two options to be chosen from, two alternative course of action to reach a particular goal. So it's a yes or no decision, such as, shall I take my umbrella today? Right? Or as just the question that was posed before to you, should the museum allow uh, a party in the hall or lend objects to be displayed somewhere else in a non-museum environment, such as airport hall? That's kind of binary or yes or no decisions. Sometimes there are more options, like which clothes should I wear today? So, range of options. Also, if we think back uh, with collections and managing, management of collections, sometimes there's a range of options to choose from to reach a particular goal. So if you're thinking, for instance, about um, budgetary planning, so where should we put the money for this two-year cycle? What are the priorities to reach the institutional goal? So there are several alternative course of action to choose from, right? So we have to uh, work that out to uh, reach our objectives. And normally, in our lives, and also with the management of, uh, of heritage collections, there's a series of decisions ongoing. Simple ones, complex ones, several decisions as we, as we move on right, to reach a particular goal. And that goal has to do with the institutional mandate. So it's important to, to have that clear. So a question now is, what's the decision-making process in the institution? So which criteria are used to, uh, to make those decisions? Who makes those, deci those decisions based on what kind of information? So often, in my experience, it's kind of a black box. I, I talk to institutions, it's like, oh yeah, we did that and that, so we've tried to trace it back. It's not so clear. So what are the criteria based on what kind of information the, those decisions are made? So I think that's a, a crucial aspect in, uh, in the management of our heritage uh, collections. So when we uh, apply risk-based decision-making to this process, it's basically we look to these decisions through a lens of risk assessment, right? So we consider the different uh, alternative course of action, and we look at the risk associated to each one of them. So we identify the risks, we analyze them, we prioritize, and we use that information to help us make the decision. So it's not, uh, I, I'm not saying risk-based decision making, the, the risk assessment is automating the decision. So the risk assessment doesn't make the decision for us, but it provides us with uh, criteria and information to inform those decisions. And of course, there are other aspects that play a role. It's not only the, the risks. But in risk-based decision making, a key criteria is uh, the assessment of risks. So that, that we use that information to help us choose the, the best uh, course of action to meet our, our goals, right? And again, the, in terms of heritage institutions and organizations, the goal has to do with the institutional mandate. So which specific, in general, it's like preservation and public access to collections in the long term. But specifically, if you are an archive or a library or a museum, so you have your institutional mandate that clarifies that. And sometimes we find surprising mandates. They're not so clear, right? In those cases, the risk assessment is not as effective as it could be because it's heading towards that objective. So it's very important to have the mandate very, very clear beforehand. It can be used at different levels, right? 
from a very simple case like one yes no decision to a comprehensive ongoing management of large heritage assets okay so just go through a couple of examples here for instance this is one about the single risk decision it's an example should the archives replace all ordinary cardboard boxes like acidic uh, wood pulp containing replaced with uh, acid-free museum quality boxes, right, which is best practice. We see a lot of archives or institutions that have archives doing that. How big is that risk if you don't replace it? So there's a serious investment there. And when we look at the, the risk of contamination of the contents of the box, especially when it's wrapped by a sheet of paper, so it's not getting in touch directly with the inner part of the box. This risk is very small. And yet the museum archives especially are investing a lot of money in, in doing that. Is it a good decision? Was it well reasoned? Or is just they're just adopting it because it's best practice? Right? So we can use risk assessment to help us inform this kind of decision. Sometimes you have to weigh different risks against each, each other. This is an example of an archive in the Amazon region in Brazil. There's archives in a historic house. And the decision here was whether to uh, cool the air in this uh, storage room uh, for the benefit of the collection. But that had uh, potentially high risk uh, problems for the building because there's high humidity outside. So you could get a mold on the wooden parts of the building. So here you have. The risk of uh, fast chemical decay of the collection against the risk of biodeterioration of the building. So which one is bigger and how, do we, how could we use that risk analysis, risk assessment to inform that decision? How big are each, risks, each risk in comparison to each other? And what's the mission? So here, for instance, it's an archive. So the collection was way more important than the building. So they went for the, the decision was to prioritize the the long-term preservation of the collection, and then to see what could be done about the building in the second. But still, this was a clear decision based on the analysis of these two risks. Uh, OK. Another uh, example, the, this risk assessment and risk-based decision-making could be applied already when you're planning a new facility, right? So the location, the kind of terrain, the the layout of the building, where the storage areas will be, where the piping will be, the, all the machines in the building. So you can plan that in advance. You can sit and talk to the architects and the engineers and say, okay, let's look at the risk here at, uh, at the design stage. What are the risks? How can we reduce risk here and improve the situation? Right? So you can make decisions about the design of a new facility looking at the risks already at the design stage, which saves a lot of money and a lot of time. You know, if, if you don't do that, you have to do it later on after the building is, is ready. And often after the collections moved there, it's a much more complex and it costs much more. Right? So it's another example. Also in uh, particular situations, so for instance, renovation work. Right? Typical situation where there's a lot of uh, uh, risk emerging. This is an example of a theater, also in, uh, in Manaus, in the Amazon uh, region in Brazil, where they were uh, renovating the building, especially on, uh, on the roof. So here is, uh, oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Here is, is the big uh, metal beam that was installed just uh, under the roof to help hold the the weight of the curtains and the lightings and everything else. So they had to move this piece up. And uh, by looking at the risks here, so this is a decorated ceiling. And there was no protection here. So this is just above the ceiling where the metal bar was going to be installed. So we assessed the risk there. And we decided to do a simulation, what you can see here just using a, a piece of the same dimensions, but just made with light wood. So we get everybody trained to, to move the thing up there and to install it using a lower risk piece instead of going for the heavy metal one. 
So after everybody was consistently trained, so they could move on and, uh, and do the, the real metallic beam. People working with uh, yeah, equipment with spark, generating sparks inside the building. So that, that soldering, for instance, that was done on, in situ, just under the roof. It's a large risk of fire there, lots of uh, combustible materials around. So this, these colleagues there, they were asked to do that work outside. So by looking at the risks that emerged because of the renovation work, so we could take action and, and make decisions to uh, reduce those risks and, uh, and do the work in a safer way, to reach the objective in a more controlled way. So this is uh, the example of the theater in Manaus. Again, uh, conservation treatment, right? When you're facing a conservation treatment, which one to use and whether to treat or not, this is also a decision, right? So we can also apply risk-based uh, thinking to say if we do nothing, what's the risk? If we adopt this treatment, what are the risks? Or there's another alternative one. So this is an example of a laser cleaning on, for paper artifacts. So a project I worked on to actually to assess what would be the benefits and the risks of applying laser cleaning to paper artifacts. Right, so we looked at immediate effects and also long-term effects. And in this case, for instance, the risk was too high. So there was a lot of uncertainty and a lot of potentially negative effects to adopt it. Even if it was a faster and automated treatment, the risk was still too high to, uh, to make it feasible. So at that, that time, it said, no, not acceptable yet. So the example, and that, that's, uh, it fits for all kinds of treatment, not only new advanced one, but every time you're considering a treatment, so you can apply also a risk-based uh, approach to see what, what are the risks associated to each course of action. And of course, you can do a comprehensive ongoing management uh, risk approach. So this is just one example of a museum. So here we look at all the risks from uh, sudden catastrophic events such as large fire or flood to the slow and, and gradual and cumulative uh, deterioration by chemical, physical, biological agents. So we do a comprehensive identification of risks. We compare the risks to each other, right? So what you see here is just the, a list of the risks and their magnitude compared to each other to help us make priorities, okay? Especially on planning, budgetary planning. So in the next two years, where should we put the, the resource? What are the priorities for the collection in its particular context? And, and by context, we mean the physical context, but also uh, the legal context, the uh, political and uh, policy context, et cetera, okay? So from single decisions to ongoing management, so it's all uh, uh, suitable to think about risk when we are doing decisions in these uh, situations. Okay, so this is coming back to a sentence that was in the announcement of the workshop. I, I'm, I'm sure you're it caught your attention there. So are the challenges of managing now bringing it back to your own uh, context? So are they keeping you awake at night? And then a few things to reflect upon in general. Collections are growing in number and diversity inside institutions, but also country-wise. So there's more uh, museums being open and uh, protected buildings being nominated and archives being collected, so they're growing in number and in diversity. We have new materials, we have digital media, so the diversity of the heritage collections is also uh, increasing. Uh, they are exposed to multiple hazards, both natural and man-made. There's a growing demand for access, sustainability, and accountability. And at least in my context, the uh, resources are shrinking. And everywhere, I, I, maybe in Canada, and, uh, okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so as heritage managers, 
I think that's a, a key question. So what to do first? How to establish priorities, right? When we are planning next two years or next year action. So what are the priorities in our context? How to make the most or the best use of the available resources which are shrinking. So often they are not enough to cover everything, right? To make, to maximize the public benefits of the collection over time. So with heritage, we are also talking long term, right? So how to make smart decisions to get there. So this is where the risk-based approach and risk management fits in as a tool, as a methodology, okay, to help us answer those questions. Uh, being a, a coordinated set of activities and methods that is used to help and direct the organization and to control the many risks that can uh, affect its ability to reach objectives or, more simply put, a risk-based decision-making methodology or approach to help the organization. This could be an individual institution, but also national, national-wide or heritage authority to meet their objectives in a more controlled, with lower uncertainty and more successful way. So this is what risk management is about. It's used in several fields, like environment, health, uh, finance. So it's a well-established methodology. And this is just the risk management cycle. For instance, uh, according to the ISO, ISO 31000 uh, standard for risk management, okay? Uh, it's an ongoing process, right? So you see the cycle there, and there are uh, different steps. So first of all, to understand the context where it's going to be applied just physical context, organizational context, political, social, cultural, economic, so we get a good idea what, where are we going to work with this methodology. We identify the risks, we analyze them, right, so we understand the, the, each risk and then we evaluate, we prioritize them to make decisions and as necessary we modify these risks. So the, the technical word is treat, but don't com confuse that with conservation treatment. It's risk treatment this time. By treating, we mean everything we do to modify the risk, to lower, right, or to transfer. Sometimes it is acceptable, so we just retain the risk and move on, just like taking an airplane. So there's a risk there, but often we accept it and fly around, right? So the three steps to get identification, analysis, and evaluation is called risk assessment. So when we say risk assessment, we are referring to those three steps. And then as we are clear on the priorities, we, uh, we take action to treat and modify those risks that we think are not acceptable, right? If we are doing an ongoing management, so we just repeat this cycle, Sometimes it just, we are just facing one one-off decision. So we identify the risks, analyze and uh, prioritize and make our decision. Okay, so the, the cycle will depend on the kind of decision we are facing. Either ongoing management or just a one-off decision. So that will dictate how often we need to repeat that. Of course, communication and consultation with all stakeholders and different uh, actors and monitoring and review to see how the process is working if we are reaching the objectives in the way we have, if the uh, anticipated, if the measures we took to reduce the risks are working well, so we monitor and, and review that. So this is a cycle, right? It's generic, so this is used for all different sectors. And here, and what, what we have been doing now in the last uh, couple of years, together with the, all these international parties, to adapt that for the heritage sector, right? And this is something we'll be discussing uh, over the, the day. Just a few highlights of the, this approach. So it's specific to the context, right? So that's very important to understand well, for instance, what's the physical context? As, are we in a seismic area or a tsunami-prone area or close to a river, 
or which kind of climate are we uh, working on. So all that, who are our neighbors? Like industrial area, I see the higher, uh, high risk of fire coming from outside. So it's very important to understand that physical context, the legal aspects, protecting the heritage collections and their implications for making decisions. That's very important to understand the legal aspect, the political environment, uh, financial context. So how how much is available for the next planning cycle, right? Can we fund elsewhere? Can we? Uh, uh, f raise funds elsewhere, is that allowed? So how much is of the resource can be dedicated to preservation, to security, etc. It's very important to have uh, the actors and stakeholders clearly identified, internal. Sometimes even inside the organization, they are not all taken into account, especially when you have large organizations that have security, conservation, and facilities. So Sometimes there's lack of communication there. And also outside, police, uh, civil defense, fire department. So there's many actors that, that play a role there, and we should identify them and engage them. Uh, all the policy and procedures concerning the organization, and sometimes the social cultural environment, situations of, I don't know, social unrest and uh, uh, armed conflicts, that kind of, of religious conflict. So it's important to take that all into account. So we're looking not only inside the storage room and display area, but it's a much broader context that's important to understand when we start to look at the risks in a comprehensive way. Uh, it is um, objective driven, right? So the focus of applying risk management or risk-based decision-making has to do with the objective of the organization. So it's, it's the objective, the mission statement drives a lot of the decisions through the assessment of risks, right? The assessment of risks, it's driven by the institutional mission, so it's objective-driven uh, process. And the values and significance are at the, at the core of the methodology, right? So we want to uh, preserve and give access to this significance over time, right? So it's very important to understand, as, as part of understanding the context, what's the significance of the heritage as to the different stakeholders. Because the decisions will also be driven by, for instance, the relative importance of different uh, components of that heritage as this is just an example from um, object that's in the uh, Museum of Antioquia in Medellin, Colombia, where you know the drug cartel is a big thing there. So this is made by an artist where it's merged the AK-47 rifle with the guitar to show that uh, you can get harmony, you can transform violence into harmony. And that's a, a huge uh, symbolic value for that city. So this is one of the highlights of the collection, special showcase, special place in a museum. And it's purely a context, right? So when we start thinking about risks and make, making priorities, the significance of the components of the heritage assets, it's, it's, uh, it's key. It's very important to take that into account. So the risks are taken into account in a comprehensive way. So we look from all types of risks, from sudden and catastrophic to gradual and cumulative process. So we try not to leave any important risk out, right? Because that can have a negative impact when we use our resource. So if we forget to consider like fire risk, for instance, which is typically high, if it's not taken into account in the planning, so maybe it not, was not the best use of the av available resource. So we scan and look at all the risks. And uh, with the methodology, we provide a numeric indicator, so uh, something to quantify the size or the magnitude of each risk. So it's not only identify the risks in a comprehensive way, so we give a quantitative indicator to, uh, to show what's the potential of each risk to cause loss of value to the heritage asset, right? And that becomes a 
a key criteria to compare risks with each other and to make decisions, to inform our decisions. Okay, so we, um, we use that. And uh, just the last thing, we uh, also look for cost effectiveness of solutions when we are trying to treat or reduce risks. So just uh, to recap, so we identify the risks, we see how big they are in relation to each other, we prioritize and then we say, okay, these are the priority risks. Then we look for uh, options to reduce them, right? And when looking for these options, we see the cost benefit or cost effectiveness ratio. See with this amount of uh, money, how much can we protect from the value of the heritage asset over time? So this is just an example. The bars there show the benefit cost ratio for different options. Okay, so each number here uh, corresponds to an option. This was done in uh, Ecuador, at the large scale uh, risk management project for all museums and uh, churches and cultural center in the country. So here we are talking uh, earthquake, tsunami, theft, fire, so all across all risks, right? And uh, the size of each bar here indicates how much we could uh, protect of the value of this large heritage asset for uh, a certain amount of money being invested there, for the same amount of money. Okay, so the higher the bar here, the more effective this, uh, this measure is. And what's interesting to see, so these all together, there were 50 options we were looking at. And if you only take the first 10, which are here inside this red rectangle, the first 10 options, they would offer 80% uh, of the protection we could uh, uh, gain by implementing all of them. So only by taking 20% of all the options, we would offer 80% of the total benefit. So it's, it's very interesting to see that relationship and often, institutions are working here because it's easy, it feels good, and then now we can do that. So often if you look at the types of decisions, so there's a lot of activity here, the low cost effectiveness, and there's not so much here, right? So when we do that kind of assessment, that, that surfaces, and then that is uh, eye-opener to, to help us improve the decision. So uh, that's an interesting aspect. And then, as I said, as we do risk management, it promotes the integration of different parts of the organization and beyond, the so different sectors and actors inside and outside the organization. For instance, conservation department, uh, facilities management, education, security, and then you can go university, fire brigade, etc. Right? As you do that, you expand, and that's a, a added benefit because it touches on different, like uh, hydrological risk, seismic risk, security. So it touches on different areas of ex expertise. So it's, uh, it encourages, and we should get out of our comfort zone and engage this, uh, these other stakeholders. Okay, so the idea is that if we adopt that, Right? So with risk management, we can have uh, better, better sleep, can sleep better at night because we uh, will be uh, more certain, not 100% certain, but more certain that the, the risks will be under control and our decisions were the, the best we could do taking into account the risks to the collection. Thank you very much. Um,